Hi there, I'm Rafael Gomez, host of TLN's Speaking Freely, and now the host of Toronto Mayoral Interviews. Toronto's going to end up with an election like no other. In June, candidates from across the political spectrum have joined in to contest one of the most widely anticipated mayoral races in the city's history, and by extension, perhaps even in the country. Last time around, very few people stepped into that ring. But our guest today is that one person. He stepped in against the incumbent mayor and did surprisingly well. That person is Gil Peñalosa. Gil, welcome to the mayoral interviews. Thank you. Thank you. So as I've started these mayoral uh, interviews before, I've asked the candidates to tell us why you're running. Now, many Torontonians first heard about you in the last mayoral race where everyone was too scared to enter. Our incumbent mayor, then John Tory, was seen as the political uh, um, leader. And I think everyone was just very afraid to expend any political capital during that kind of race. But you did, quite bravely mm -hmm. stepped in the race and surprised many people by the number of votes that you attracted, over 100,000 mm -hmm. uh, in the city. Gil, you're running again, but the field is so much different. Uh, last time around, you were a voice for uh, pr progress, innovative ideas that were brought from other countries and jurisdictions. You can talk a little bit about your own history. Um, and uh, this time around, what's your platform? Does it differ from the last time you ran? And uh, why would Torontonians vote for you this time? Well, thank you. Well, last time, I wasn't going to run. But at the beginning of last year, I started calling all the people that could run, uh, Kismet, Layton, uh, many of the ones running now, Madlo, uh, everybody said no. Tory has too much money, he has mm -hmm. too much power, so they were not running. I said, look, elections is not only about winning in votes, but it's about raising issues, sharing ideas with the citizens. But no one did. They were too busy. <laughs> but, but, but apparently, six months later, now they have time. <laughs> Last time, in 100 days, since the day I registered to the election, there were 100 days, and I had 100,000 votes. That's a lot of votes. That's more than any Hispanic has ever gotten anywhere in Canada. Mm. Uh, that's also more than the votes that the mayor of Mississauga or Brampton or Hamilton got. So it's, it's a lot of votes. So I have a, a commitment with those people. Last time I ran because I felt the city was moving in the wrong direction. It was less affordable. It was less equitable, less sustainable. The huge housing crisis, huge mm. mobility crisis. I think Mayor Tory was a disaster in every way. I think the only, day, the only thing that he really did was that after an even worse Rob Ford, which was the lowest that Toronto has ever had, then anyone would have looked like a fantastic mayor. But that really was off after six months. And in eight years, his results in every area whether it's housing or mobility or safety or anyone, was a disaster. Even now, I'm surprised that the city council is having a financial crisis, and they say, oh, we didn't know. What were you doing if you didn't know? Many of those councillors have been there for 10, 20, 30 years. Mm. I mean, they should have known. But anyway, case. now, Tory came out and resigned because he was having an affair for the last two and a half years. I'm surprised that no one brought it out because everybody at City Hall knew about this. This, this was no real secret. But nevertheless, he was a, 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 he, he's the typical picture of entitlement. He was entitled since he was a little kid in elementary school, at summer camps, at fancy private schools, at Rogers. He lives Rogers and he continues to get $1,000 every year while he's mayor. And, and then he is having the affair and no one brings it up during the campaign. Maybe I would be the mayor today if they had brought it up during the campaign. But anyway, he resigns. We don't really know why he resigned because this is something that had been going on for over two and a half years. The fact that he resigned within six hours of getting an interview, of getting some questions from the Toronto Star, leaves a lot of questions out in the open. But here we're not gonna talk about him because the reality is a disaster. I mean, we couldn't have uh, mobile phones. We couldn't speak on the phone even to have safety on the subways because there was a conflict of interest with Rogers where he was getting paid. Now, all of the sudden, Rogers says, oh, we can do it. That's not a big issue because he's no longer the mayor. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of issues. He says, oh, I declare uh, conflict of interest over a hundred times. Yeah, but his friends, the councillors were making the decisions. So that, that's really plain politics. 
why am I running? Because I think that everything that I thought was wrong six months ago, it is still wrong. The only difference is that now we have more candidates from different areas, from left, from right, from center, from different areas. But I'm running because I think that we need a new voice. I think that the people that have been there, for example, we have the chief of police. He was chief of police for over five years with over a billion dollars every year. And he was a complete failure as, pol as chief of police. The city was not better at all after his five years as chief. I mean, we have the deputy mayor who ran housing. For seven years, he ran housing. And they created an organization to build housing. Not one shovel on the ground. Mm -hmm. So why is it that they have had such a huge failure in, in police, huge failure in housing, and now they're telling Torontonians to give him the whole city? So I, I, I do think that we need things that are better. I think that we have concrete. I have worked in over 350 cities all over the world, in all continents. I have a lot of ideas. Also, I have been doing, I have experienced doing. I built over 200 parks in Bogota before I immigrated to Canada. In Canada, I created a nonprofit organization mm -hmm. called 880 Cities, and we have been very successful. Gil, can I just stop you there? Of course. I mean. We're going to continue, and you're going to, but I want to pick up on a theme you just mentioned, which is one that I, I think the mayoral candidate, as you said, many people have spe stepped into the ring this time around without the incumbent mayor there, and you said some bold things about our incumbent mayor, uh, but you are an outsider, and you don't hide that. You say, I've come from the outside. I'm an immigrant to this country. I haven't worked in City Hall, and you're using that as your advantage. Can you just speak to that point from two levels? One, the immigrant. Toronto is a, not only a city of immigrants, it's it's a majority immigrant city, yet its political institutions are, you, are run, as you said, by people who are more or less insiders. Um, why is it so hard for an immigrant to break through? And second, what does that picture of being the outsider give you as an advantage? I know you said the disadvantages of the insiders. They haven't got things done that they should have, and their track record, according to you, is, is less than perfect. But on those two levels, how does someone from the outside, especially an immigrant, the city's made up of immigrants, why is it so hard for those political institutions to allow people like yourself there? And then second, what advantages come from being that outside voice? Well, by the way, I yeah. didn't say less than perfect. I said bad. <laughs> when we look at the last 10 years, on any indicator, more p people walking are being killed by drivers. More people are being mugged on the streets. The uh, public mm -hmm. transit is less safe. Housing, it has been a huge failure in affordable and deep affordable housing. So it, it's been a huge failure, not, not less than perfect. But the immigrants, the immigrants, more than half of us living in Toronto were born in another country. So first generation immigrants. We come here at a huge cost. We leave our families, our friends, and we come for the dream of Toronto, the dream of Canada, and we hit a wall. And then, all of a sudden, no one cares about the immigrants. We need nurses, but the nurses are flipping hamburgers. We need electricians, but they are cleaning buildings. Uh, we, we need all of these pro professional people, and no one helps. The mayor said, oh, it's not my problem, it's the province. The province says, oh, it's the federals. The federal said, no one helps. And the reality is that the mayor, if you are the mayor of a city where more than half are immigrants, it should take care of it. It should lead. Because if the immigrant that has two and three jobs wants to complain to the Minister of Labor, they will never listen to him or her. But if the mayor of Toronto wants a, a meeting with the Ministry of Labor at the f provincial or federal level, they will give him. So, so you need to take that, I, I think. Yep. Also, we need to live by example. Can you imagine, Rafael, the people at City Hall that have mm. been hired in the last eight years, mm. the top people, the city manager, the mm. three deputy managers, mm. the person running transportation and parks and planning, all are white, all are white. I'm not saying that it should be 50-50. But couldn't they have found one, one visible minority to be among the top people running the city? So, and these people cannot blame and say, oh, it's elected official. No, it's not elected, it's appointed. Mm. The mayor had the capacity to appoint. 
Yeah. Couldn't he have found one? So I think this yeah. is one of the reasons why the immigrants are not coming in, and I, I and, and I think that we gotta help everybody. Mm. We gotta. I mean, our priority has to be the most vulnerable people, mm -hmm. people that are poor, people that have racial minorities, sure. ethnic minorities. So but, that ha has to be a, a priority. But as you said, people come with skills. These people are, are not low skilled that are coming to our country. Come with expectations, and we're kind of letting them down. Uh, and I think that's that's. Uh, that's true, and that's seen in some of the surveys that we're now getting. Immigrants are really feeling let down. The, the other point that I was making is, okay, you can see those issues, because you yourself are an immigrant, have left places that uh, your family and your social connections were built on. How does that help you as mayor? What, what can you bring? Because the, op the opposite side is, you don't know how the city runs internally. You don't know which buttons to push and how to move the bureaucracy. How would you overcome those uh, detractors that say mm -hmm. you need a, a political insider because that's the knowledge that'll get things done versus what you're saying is this knowledge of the rest of the world can actually move Toronto to a, a different place. Well, we have seen a lot of mayors around the world that are successful that had not been councillors first. I mean, you can see Bloomberg in New York, uh, some of the things that he did. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of mayors all over the place. I think we have a lot of really good people working in the public sector, lots of fantastic staff, but they are unmotivated. They don't feel that they're there, they, they don't see that they are doing meaningful jobs. I do think that we have a failure, not only on some of the elected officials, but also some of the top people in the area. So I do think that the mayor has the authority to pick and choose the top people, so we, we gotta do that. But I also see. a top priority has to be how to motivate the city staff, how mm. to listen to them, how to mm. take advantage of that knowledge and that experience mm. that, that we are missing. Yes, that, that, that is a critical issue that we have missed. Sure, and just to know, my, like part of my other day job is a professor of industrial relations, labor relations, that's what we always talk about. This, the workers themselves probably have more knowledge than the people managing. It's about taking that knowledge and using it and getting the workers involved. So credit oh, that, to you. That's that is critical. Yeah. We need to motivate them. I think the overwhelming majority of people that work in the public sector, mm -hmm. they went into the public sector because they wanted to create a better city, a better province, a better mm -hmm. community. But then all of the sudden they're hidden and then they some quit and leave, mm -hmm. but the majority quit and stay. Yeah, right. They just come from nine to five, they yeah. do the minimum, they don't wanna rock the boat. Mm -hmm. So no, we need them to rock the boat. We need to come up with innovative ideas. Uh, I'm not saying you should take the slogan, but rock the boat would be a great uh, good slogan for what you've just said. Yeah, because uh, we need that. We, we are in a huge crisis. Toronto and the GTA is the fastest growing region in the world, in the developed world of mm -hmm. population. Today we got about five million people in the GTA. Within 25 years, we're gonna have seven and a half million people. So where are people gonna live? How are they gonna move? Where are they gonna shop? Where are gonna be their friends, their yeah. parks? That is the kind of vision that we need. But I have not seen it at the city level, and of course not seen it at the provincial level either. Gil, can I take this theme and now broaden it, not just to the staff, but to the whole citizenry of the city? We're here at, uh, in, at TLN Studios, which is in the northwest part of the city, a very multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious community, far from downtown. How does a city create that energy? Like you say you're going to energize the public uh, service, but the citizens also need energy. You know, your, your election, mm. you were the only candidate that entered the ring of any significance. You brought 100,000 voters to vote for you, but it was the lowest turnout. We need to do better, and I think you, you, you obviously that's what motivates you. But how do you get to different parts of the city? The, I don't know when you arrived in mm. Toronto exactly, but about 30 years ago there was a decision to uh, amalgamate the city, create a mega city. We had local city halls that dealt with those issues that the people in the northwest part of the city in Rexdale or in northeast Scarborough, that's gone. Those city halls are gone, gone away, and we have one downtown. There's a sense of alienation that often occurs in the periphery of any mm. community, any region. What do you do to get those people excited, to rock the boat, if you will, amongst the citizens? First, I gotta be honest with the people in the suburbs. In the last campaign, I went to every neighborhood of the city, all of all the wards, and the city has failed. City Hall has failed the suburbs. City Hall also has failed the, the immigrants. But the suburbs, there is a very clear difference between the suburbs and downtown. And the, the, the councillors from the suburbs have failed the suburbs themselves. I mean, they are voting to do bike lanes, but only in the downtown. They are voting, voting to have parks and activities and programs, but in the downtown. 
So when you go to the parks in the suburbs, the quantity and quality of the programs are much lower than in the mm -hmm. downtown. We need to eliminate that. For example, one thing that I'm gonna do that is very simple, I'm gonna do Mondays with the mayor. What is Mondays with the mayor? Every single Monday of the year, I'm gonna hold a community meeting in a different ward. So they don't have to go to City Hall. I'm not gonna be nailed to the desk at City Hall. I'm gonna go to a different ward and on a session that first half hour, I'm gonna share what we're doing. But the other half hour, I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna hear. And I'm gonna bring city staff to have different tables so if people have issues about mobility, about planning, about parks, about whatever, they can go to the different tables. Mm -hmm. So every single Monday in a different world. So there has to be a commitment. When the people, I, we do know very clearly that there are not enough community centers in the suburbs. For example, safety in the streets. People are very concerned about safety. Too many people are being killed on the streets. The other day, I, I was at, at a food bank uh, in Scarborough, and I asked three women that were there getting food, and I said, okay, if I become mayor, what do you want me to do? They said, safe streets. Hmm. And I said, what, is there a problem of violence? She said, no, 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 no violence. Drivers killing. We are terrified that yeah. our children are gonna be killed yeah. while they are walking to the park or walking to school. By the way, there's when you analyze the hundred most dangerous intersections in Toronto, mm -hmm. ninety percent are in the suburbs. Yeah. The number one area where people are killed by drivers is in Scarborough. Yeah. So, so this is not a downtown issue. This is a city, uh, an issue citywide, sure. especially in the suburbs. Okay, that that's good. I mean, I, I like that idea of the outreach to the community, not making the community sort of come into the central And for part. example, having the 100 most dangerous intersections, mm -hmm. let's redesign it in the first two years. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't need to, we, we have the data. The most important things to the citizens is to let them know that these issues are not technical. The yeah. People know the solutions. Mm -hmm. These are not financial, they are political. We need the political will and guts to do what needs to be done. Well, Gil, um, can I just take one idea that you've proposed in the past and then uh, flush it out a bit more, or the one that you just mentioned, right? You said that uh, uh, a lot at the beginning about the failures of the existing candidates who have had an insider's view of politics. You clearly are saying you have the outsider's view, but say on the housing file, um, what would you do different? What would make housing a more affordable, allow the 2.5 million extra people that are gonna come into the GTA, what are the specifics say just on that one one set of issues? Very different. I would do four actions. First, I would allow people to subdivide the homes. Too many people now are empty nesters. They live in a house that is too big and too expensive. And if we allow them as of right, so they don't need to go and ask for as of right to subdivide in two or three or four units. So all of the sudden is gonna be great for the owners because now they can live in one fourth and rent out the other three and get an income year after year after forever. Hmm. Who's gonna do the renovations? Thousands and thousands of renovations. Small and medium sized contractors. So it's gonna be great for them. And who's gonna be rent? Everybody. Now renters are gonna have possibilities all over the city. And this can be done very, very fast, immediately. We could add over 100,000 units. Second, on the, on the transit corridor, the public transit, where we have buses or street cars, so small, we are gonna allow as of right to do six stories. We mm. get the same density with six stories next to each other than with 60 stories every other block. Mm. But people live a lot more humane mm -hmm. in the six story buildings. And on the large, we could get 600,000 units there. And on the large transit corridor, such as the subway or the LRTs, 12 stories, 12 stories, 100 by 100, mm. we could get another 600,000 units. Finally, wherever we have the, the shopping centers, we got about 30 of those in Toronto. We, the, the, not as of right, but then those master plan, we could get another 300,000 units. And finally, the lands that are owned by the city, mm -hmm. public lands, mm -hmm. should be 100% affordable or deep affordable. I find it incredible that some of the candidates are proposing to do market rate and affordable. Market rate, no, oh, no place as easy to do affordable and deep affordable than in the land that we own. So we don't need a, a profit, we don't need to put the price. In those, just in those four actions, we could open up space for 1.7 million units. Mm. We only need 10% of those. 10% of those by 2030, mm. and another 10% by 2050. Because since all of those is private lands, and mm. we can promote, incentivize, whatever, but yeah. we're not doing it, 
then we need to open up space up to 1.7 million and hope that 10% of those will become reality by 2030. Okay. By the way, we yeah. don't need one single centimeter in the green belt. I think it's very, very dangerous, the green belt. Mm -hmm. And even though the green belt is not part of the Toronto municipality, right. the environment doesn't have any political, uh, po po political barriers. So the water that we get through the creeks and the rivers and the Absolutely. quality of the air mm -hmm. comes from the green belt. So we should care about that. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for giving us that specificity, that level of detail, because I, every candidate has a, a big, broad agenda, uh, but it's nice to hear where you're going to take those ideals and sort of flush them out. Um, thank you, Gil. This has been a pleasure to hear uh, your story, first of all, and also why you've re-entered the race this time around. And uh, I thank you for being the brave person that ran against Tory the last time and no, running again. And I do think that we could have a Toronto for everyone Absolutely. that is affordable, beautiful, and fun. It has to be a fun city because one of the main things that we need to do is do all that we can to retain our best people, mm -hmm. to attract the best people, because then the better businesses, the better jobs are, go are gonna come after those. All of this is doable. So I invite the, 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 all the viewers, not only about me, look at all the candidates. Now we got dozens of candidates. Mm -hmm. So look at them, I participate, because this is about everyone's quality of life. Sure. This is about cleaning the, uh, the snow mm -hmm. and having activities in the parks and opening libraries on Sundays. Now 90% of the library, we have the best library system in the world, but 90% of them are closed on Sundays mm -hmm. and evenings. So, so vote, learn about everyone's policies, yeah. programs, and vote. That's great, Gil. And to our audience uh, around the country, this could be a great draw to Toronto, right? So, exactly. So thank you so much, Gil. And uh, join us on our next mayoral candidate interview. <laughs>